I'm Emer von Atzinger, and this is a null binding class, and it's an intermediate class. So you really need to know a stitch, at least one stitch before you're able to do some of the things I'll be showing tonight. But if you don't know a stitch and you just wanna watch, that's fine too. Um, in the chat, can people just sort of say who has needle and yarn with them? And um, just so I can get a idea of people who are going to be trying to do the things we're showing tonight as we go along. What I'm going to be doing is showing um, a round start, which is how you can start mittens from the top down uh, like these. Like this, you start at the top and go down. Or um, a round start hat, you can do the same thing, you just increase more. Um, and I will be showing you how to put the thumb in and how to do um, start at the toe on a round start and then go to where you're putting, putting the heel in like that. Okay, the first thing you need to do for a round start is a slip knot. And a slip knot looks like this, kind of a little noose. And we want a slip knot that when you pull this little tail, it makes the loop get smaller like that. So if you already know how to do a slip knot, Go ahead and do one and then I will show you how I do it. All right. Okay. I just use two fingers like that. I wrap it around. I don't know if you can see that. And then I take it the tail between my two fingers, pull the sides up, and you get a slip knot with the side where you, the little tail, when you pull it, it makes it get smaller. Some people just sort of do it like, like that. That's fine too. All right. So you want to thread your knob binding needle through the end without the loop. And I hold the loop like this. I put my thumb over the knot. Well, first I put that on, on that side. So the trailing thread comes off the top, hold it 
between your thumb and your first finger at the knot. Take your needle and go under through the loop and where it just makes another loop on the outside of, let's see if I can get that where you can see it, the, oh, that's not doing very well. It makes a loop around the slip knot loop that you made. The second thing you do is You do that again, go under the slip knot loop and catch the loop you just made, go through it and come back. And you just keep doing that. For a round start, I do about 12 usually. It kind of makes a difference if you're using really thick yarn or really thin yarn, but when you get to 12, you'll have something that looks like this. and it wants to twist. So you have to make it straight and look like a little wreath. Like The reason you wanted to make the slip knot so the short tail draws up the loop is you're gonna pull that and tighten it around the stitches that you just made. And you pull it as tight as you can without breaking the yarn. And then it looks like that. Here's one a little bit bigger yarn. When you draw it up, it makes a circle. It's this. Now, this little tail is gonna drive you crazy. So kind of hold it back out of the way somewhere. And this, your working thread, or sometimes it's called the trailing thread, you want to come back around your thumb like that. Now, you haven't done anything yet to make sure that this little wreath isn't going to come apart again, it will pull apart if you pull on it. So you have to bind those two ends together. And I go back, sometimes it's hard to see which of these are your actual loops, but you got to kind of find them. And I go back to and that makes it a stronger join. Then you catch the first one, first loop on the other side, go under the thread. I don't know if you can see that. And then pull it tight. 
and that locks your two ends together. Then go back through the same place you were. Under the thread, under the yarn, kind of makes a circle. Stick your thumb up through that circle. Pull it through. And that's your first, that's your thumb loop. Now, I'm just going to do the Oslo stitch right now. So you pick up one, go under, and slip it off. I'm going to tighten it to the needle. So I'm pulling my thread to where it's just touching the top of the needle. Pull it through and you've done a stitch. You want to double, you want this circle to get bigger. So you're gonna put two stitches in each one. Slip it off, tighten it down. You don't want to pull it so tight that you can't on the next round get your needle through. So don't tighten it, don't yank it, just tighten it down to where it touches the needle. Okay, now I went through that. It's kind of hard to tell on the video if people need me to go back. Um, if you have questions or you want to see it again, can you um, turn on your mics and tell me? Okay. All right, is everybody okay so far? Okay, so you just keep going around. And it sort of depends on how big you want to make it. If you want, if you have a person with a big hand, you may do that for two rounds, do double stitches for two rounds. You just kind of have to look at what you're getting and decide. Um, for my hand, I do one round double and then the next, the second round, I'll do every other double until it gets to the size that I want it. You can do hats the same way. Start with um, start with the round start. If you want a flat hat like a beret, you keep doubling the stitches as you go around until you get it how you want it. And then if you need to tighten it down, then you decrease. And by decrease, I mean, instead of picking up the next loop, you pick up two. And do your stitch. I'm doing a, the finish stitch for this. So I would pick up, do my, do my stitch as normal and keep on going, except I wasn't in the right thing. All right, so suppose you've gone around and gone around and you've gotten it down to where you need your thumb to be.
Okay. Now, this is where I want to start to make the opening for where the thumb is going to go. Regularly, I would go to the next stitch and pick it up. And that would attach it. Now I'm just going to do my stitch without picking up any loops on the fabric and do a chain. And you do that till you get a long enough chain to go around your thumb. Try it on your hand. That's not quite going to be long enough. So I'll do a couple of more stitches. And then I kind of stretch it along. And I pick up two loops because that makes it stronger. And just keep doing my stitch. Okay, now you have kind of something that looks like a buttonhole. And if you're making something modern, a sweater, that, that's how you make a buttonhole. And then you just keep going around. When you get to the wrist, you just have to kind of shape it to make it go in right at the sides, you decrease. So here's some fingerless mittens that I started and that's how I made the hole. To get where you want the thumb to be. I decide which side I want to be the right side. And I'll start from the back and go under a stitch and kind of sew it in place. 
That's just to anchor it down. And then I'll turn it back to the right side. Put my thumb under the yarn. And pick up a loop. Go around and you have your start of your thumb loop. You may have to do that a couple of times to get enough loops to do whatever stitch you're doing. I'll do the Oslo for this. So I can't, I'm going to come back up through the same one, go under the thumb loop. Flip it off and I'm going to tighten it down a little bit and now I can progress to the next loop and just do my stitch. And you do that all the way around. At least on this first row to make it stronger, I like to go under the next loop, pick up the next loop and go under the old loop too. That just kind of makes it stronger. Pick up that the first loop for the Oslo, tighten it up a little bit and keep on going. You'll start to get a tube when you get to the end of your thumb. You just got to kind of do it by eye and start decreasing until it gets so tight you can't do another stitch and, and that's where you end. Do you have questions now? Does anybody want to see that again? Okay. Four socks. You have your tube. Um, it's really important as you're going through for things like mittens and socks where you're doing two that you're trying to match that you, um, you do a few rows and then you go back, you start your second one, do the same amount of rows, compare them back and forth to make sure you're getting them the same size and go back and forth like that until you get to the point on socks where your ankle is. So this, in this finished sock, right here is where my ankle goes. And this is the part that goes around the top of your ankle like this. So here is, this is just at exactly the right point. So do exactly the same thing like on the thumb for the mitten, you stop attaching and you make your chain long enough so that it will go around your ankle. So if this is my ankle, it's gonna go 
all the way around and be pretty snug to the other side. If you're making socks for somebody else and you can't try them on yourself as you go, they maybe they have a bigger foot than you or a smaller foot, they make um, for knitting, they make, uh, well, use it for this too. Um, the, things that, the things that you use when you um, set the stitches, when you put it in some hot water and you um, set the stitches, uh, they're frames and you can use those to make, um, they, they come in small, medium, large. So you do the same thing and you attach to the other side. You do two, pick up two loops and do your stitch like normal. I would pull it tight to the needle because you're attaching it. And then you do in a circle around, around, around. And that's what makes your ankle. That's what makes your ankle. You attach on, just like I showed you for the, um, in the opening for the mitten, you would attach on right there from the back. You do one round all the way around. When you come to this corner, you're going to decrease. So for about four stitches in the corner, decrease. So pick up two loops at a time. Go around to the next corner. You do the same thing. You keep trying it on yourself or, or on your form. And when you get on the second round, when you get to the middle portion here and here, you increase. So for two stitches right in the middle, you increase. And that's what gives you the heel shape. Decreasing at the corners and increasing at the middle. You do that until it gets big enough to go around the fat part of your heel. Once it's that big, then instead of increasing at the middle part and the and decreasing at the corners you just decrease until it flattens out another way people do heels 
And so I'll just do a round cone, the shape of your heel like this. Well, it gets it the size that they want. And then they basically sew it on from the back side. There's several other different styles of heels that you can do. Um, there's tutorials online for those. Um, there is, there's one more um, type of mitten I want to show you. It makes kind of a, instead of a rounded rounded top like this when you put it on, where it comes to a point. It's kind of a flat, I don't know if you can see that. It's a flat, flatter edge, it's more squared. You see mittens done both ways in period. So, The first thing you do is a chain of any, whatever stitch you want. So you make the chain about the length of your fingers, the top of your fingers like that, plus about an inch. You, you bend it up back towards, make kind of a S curve on the top a curve on the top. And I'd say it's one, two, three, four, five. It's about five stitches in, five or six stitches in. You pick up two loops. And do your stitch. Just keep doing your stitch. And on this, I would only increase every other stitch to get it the shape that you want. I mean, you, you can watch as you go along because it makes a difference how thick or thin your yarn is. but you want to um, give it a little bit of volume. And you just keep going. Until you get all the way to the end of your chain. When you get to the end, you're just going to go around. I've, just, I've got a couple of more there to go and I'll show you how you go around the end. Okay, when you get to the end, it's not really a loop but you need, you can, um, 
get your needle under it and do a stitch. And at the end, you, you do need to increase. So you need to do a couple of stitches at the end. And that's how this mitten is started. You just keep increasing to at the very ends till you get it um, as wide as you want, as full as you want it. And then from there on, you just, you just do regular stitches. That's how I did this bag. I made a long chain. I, I felted it, so it's a little bit hard to see, but I did a long chain and bent it over, attached it, and just kept circling around, increasing a little bit. Um, I increased probably till about here and then where I wanted it to narrow down, instead of increasing, I decreased the stitch. And I just did that for one row and then um, went on around. You can do stockings the same way. These are, the stitching may be easier to see, I don't know, but um, I just made the cone. When I got to the point of where you want your ankle to be and where the heel goes, you make one loop around your ankle, keep on going up and then come back and fill in the, he the heel. <clears throat> we talked about top top down hats. This is a bottom down hat. So I started at the part that goes around your forehead and I made it as big as it needed to be. So what you do for a bottom up hat, and this is really how I like to do hats because you can make it fit. I make a really long chain. And if you have, and if you're doing a stitch that twists, it makes it really important to untwist it when you're doing this part. So as I go along, I'm checking to make sure, see how it goes around my head. And what you want is for it to overlap a little bit and you want it to be loose. You want to be able to get your fingers under it when you're holding it together. Because when you do the second row, it tightens up and you'll get it too small if you, if you don't um, make it a little loose on the first row. Okay. 
So for this, Um, you got it as big as you want it. And we're going to overlap it because we're going to take up um, at least two stitches on the first go around so that we make it stronger, the um, joint stronger. And then I'm gonna do the Oslo on this round. You just do your stitch. And you keep on going. And you end up is something that looks like this. This is a half done hat. So it's basically a headband right now. <clears throat> At the point where you want it to start getting smaller, this is a small head. This isn't a regular person size head. So <clears throat> let's say about right here is where I want it to start getting smaller and break over your head. Okay, then I start decreasing. So instead of picking up the next stitch and doing my stitch, this is the finished stitch, two plus two finished stitch, I pick up two. And that's gonna make this round get smaller. On the first round, I decrease, then I do 11 more stitches, and on the 12th one, I decrease again. And I do that all the way around back to where I started decreasing. Some people, some people use um, stitch markers I just count um, and I usually start and stop at the, at the place that looks like that. That's your very first stitch. Then on the second round, I'll decrease more often. So I'll decrease every 10 stitches. And again, you try it on, you look at it in the mirror, if it's getting the shape you want. Um, if you want it more peaked, you decrease slower. If you want it less peaked, you decrease faster. You'll get to a point where it almost looks like this, only with a um, little hole in the middle. You just kind of pick up a stitch from each side and draw it tight and stick the thread back through the back side and sew it through some stitches on the back side and that anchors it down.
So this is a bottom up hat. I didn't make it very peaked, but if you wanted to, you could decrease slower and the, the peak of it will get taller and it will look, it, you can even do it to where it's long enough, tail enough that it'll um, fold over. I feel like I've thrown a lot at people. Maybe everybody already knew everything that I just told you. Okay, we you... have one question here from okay. Phil Brand's daughter. When I'm try when I've tried to making a hat like that, bottom up, it wound up with a weird ruffle at the bottom. Is there a trick to avoiding that? Um, I think maybe the second round you were pulling tighter than the um, first round, maybe. That's the only thing I can think of. Just watch your tension, try and make it the same. Um, because if you decrease too fast, sometimes it'll kind of ruffle like that too. Um, but do you, did you keep it? Do you have it? If you send me a picture of it, I'll look at it. Oh, no, I threw that away. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, just the second round tightens up anyway. So just be really careful that you're not making smaller stitches as you go around. I think that might have been it. Any more questions? That was a good question. I would be glad if you Facebook me or um, email me. I can write down my email and give it to you. Um, to answer questions or do a video chat where you show me what you're doing and maybe I can help you figure out some something or show you some of the stuff that I just showed you one on one. When we're in the real world, I like to teach one on one. So I do um, one hour sessions individually with people. And I usually, at an event, maybe I'll have a sign-up sheet and do four or five of those. And um, I'll probably start that back up again when, when we're having events again. Do we have another question? We have someone saying, thank you so much for the class. Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, I can't tell you how strange it is to sort of talk to yourself and not be able to really see what people are doing. So I hope it was helpful. It's not, I'm sorry, um, but uh, Facebook me or get in touch with me and we'll figure out how to do what you need to do. I do the two plus two finish stitch a lot for hats or mittens because it doesn't twist and roll like some of them. So it's easier when you're, you know, when you're joining it together, like the York stitch, it twists really bad. And sometimes I've had to pin it down to something like this and hold the steam iron over it so it stays straight long enough to attach. So um, that's why I like the finish stitch because it's it stays really straight and it's easier to do. Have any um, book recommendations? Yes. Um, <laughs> I do. 
Um, I taught myself from this book. It's the um, Sigurd Bryan's daughter or Anne Marie Decker book. She's a Laurel in the SCA. Um, but that was way before there were videos online um, when I taught myself. So I like to go to um, There's a lady online that has uh, that has every stitch you could ever imagine. She has hundreds of stitches on video. Um, I don't have it right in front of me, but if you Google knob binding videos, you'll come up with her videos, and she does a really good job of showing you how to do stitches. And that's how I learn new stitches. There are some not very good books out there. There's one that's a Danish translation and it's probably a good book in Danish, but the translation's not very good. Um, so you, it's hard to buy knob binding books online. You kind of need to see them. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, a null binding Facebook group that's pretty good and that will answer people's questions and um, that sort of thing. And it has people from all over the world on it and you get to see their projects. So it's, I enjoy it. I do know oh. that uh, Sigrid's been hosting regular now bending sessions on weekends. Uh, um, yeah. So if you keep your eyes open in fiber groups, you yeah. should be able to find out about those. Yeah. If you just search Facebook, her Facebook um, now binding group comes up and it's really good. Yeah, I believe she's in the book as Anne Marie Decker. Yeah, it is Anne Marie Decker. Three words. Well, I appreciate you all. Um, I like I said, when we get back to normal events, just catch me and we'll sit down in Albine. Thank you so much. You're welcome. We have so much to look forward to. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks right. very much, Amor. It was an excellent class. Right. Well, thank you.